All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this month's Teach Educational Rounds. Here with us today, we have Lisa Beatty and Megan Barker, who will be presenting on commercial tobacco cessation with Indigenous communities. Before I hand it off to our presenters, I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping slides. If you're interested in receiving a letter of completion for today's Teach Educational Round, please make sure that you have registered for this webinar and completed the pre-learning assessment. As well, you have signed in to view this webinar using your first and last name so we can track your participation. And finally, you have completed the post-learning assessment, which will be emailed to you by the end of tomorrow, and you will have one week to complete that. Please note that a copy of today's presentation slides will be sent along with the recording this afternoon as well. Here is a little bit more information on our presenters today. Lisa Beatty is here with us today from her role with Ontario Health and position as Cancer Care Ontario's Indigenous Tobacco Wise Lead South. Megan Barker is one of our very own and has been working as an education specialist for the Nicotine Dependence Service for many years, while also working to complete her PhD at the Dalalana School of Public Health. You can read more about their backgrounds here. Here is a list of their disclosures. And here's some information on our disclosures. Please note that the content of teach educational rounds are centered on evidence based guidelines from the following sources. These materials, as well as the verbal presentation and any discussions represent only general principles and they do not remove the need for clinical assessments or treatment plans by healthcare professionals. Please feel welcome to use the chat feature during today's webinar to provide any feedback or post any questions. To use the chat feature, you can click on the speech bubble icon in the control panel, and please ensure that you select everyone to make sure that the panelists and the host can read your questions. As a note, this feature was previously labeled as all participants. With that, I will leave it to our presenters to take it away. Thank you everyone and enjoy the webinar. Lisa, you're muted. Sorry, I was muted. Sorry, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Honey, bonjour. As it's quite Dishna costume, missing Dunjaba, Mikig Dodum. My name is Lisa Beatty. I work at Ontario Health in the Indigenous uh, Tobacco Program, and I'm a proud band member of Bolsa First Nation. Thanks, Lisa. And hi, everyone. I'm Megan Barker. Um, as Sophie mentioned, education specialist with the Nicotine Dependence Service at CAMH. Have been working here for 11 years as of August 9th. <laughs> so feel like a bit of an old timer, but <laughs> um, we're really excited to both be here today. Um, so Lisa, I believe I have control of the slides. So I'm going to be your Vanna White today. If that All reference, right. that Wheel of Fortune reference is still relevant for our audience, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, so I'll, I'll uh, advance to the next slide. Uh, it doesn't seem to be working, but hold on just one sec. Let me see. Uh, Do you want me to call a friend? Oh, I have to press it here. That's fine. No worries. I got it. <laughs> it's all good. So, uh, recognizing and honoring the land, there's lots of land uh, acknowledgement. So for me personally, it is a twofold, both a positive and a negative as well. So that's just my belief. And I just want you to take a minute to uh, recognize that the land that you may be on uh, was first and foremost uh, inhabited by Indigenous people here in Ontario or in Canada. I'm, I'm currently situated in, uh, in Simcoe Muskoka County or Township or whatever you want to call it, uh, I'm about 45 minutes from my First Nation and I'm about 20 minutes to uh, Ram and Machikening First Nation. So that's the, the place I am. But you know what? In terms of honoring the land, I'll share with you about honoring the land. Wherever I go, I always put down tobacco and honor that land and that mother earth, no matter where I go. I was in Europe, I did that when I was in Europe. 
when I was in uh, Bahamas, I did that in Bahamas. So no matter where I go, I honor Mother Earth and the people, the indigenous people of that land to recognize them. So I just want to say that. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, oh, wrong way. <laughs> And so we already both kind of mentioned a little bit about who we are, but Lisa, is there anything you want to add before I jump in? So this is just a picture of me and my mom. This is on our first nation. And if you look really, really close, you could see that I was a smoker at 1 time. So I know, uh, the struggles of being a tobacco user and also the positive attributes of uh, quitting and helping support in that uh, quit attempt of commercial tobacco. Thanks, Lisa. And just a little bit more about me. So I am not Indigenous. I am a settler of Irish, English, and Scottish descent. Um, my ancestors um, have been settlers on Turtle Island for at least six generations. Um, I have a 3 year old son named William. There he is right there. He keeps me super busy. He's very spirited. <laughs> um, but, you know, a large part of my role over the last 11 years working with. Um, the nicotine dependent service has been developing culturally safe and relevant commercial tobacco cessation training and supports for healthcare providers. Uh, who work with indigenous communities and then also working alongside uh, the stop with AHACS program, which we'll talk a little bit more about later in the presentation, um, which is supporting a culturally safe model of cessation pharmacotherapy delivery with indigenous health organizations. So that's a little bit about who we are and the work that we do. And um, Let's get started then. <laughs> um, so in Canada, Indigenous peoples are comprised of three distinct and diverse groups, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. More than 56 Indigenous languages are spoken throughout Canada. Indigenous peoples live and work in different settings across the country, including urban centres, rural settings, and communities with sometimes fly-in only or boat-only access. Indigenous peoples live both on and off reserve. Colonial, sorry, colonialist practices forced upon Indigenous peoples, such as residential schooling, the 60s scoop, and geographic displacement, among many others, have had intergenerational impact on individuals, families, and communities. And findings from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2015 regarding the history of residential schooling illuminated that the legacy of these colonialist practices and processes can be seen through the poor health and well-being outcomes among Indigenous peoples, including um, high tobacco, commercial tobacco cessation rates. Sorry, I'm just fixing this one second. I... Here we go. So, you know, given this diversity, a pan indigenous approach to behavior change interventions, including cessation is not helpful or appropriate. And, you know, as we go through this presentation, uh, really think and reflect on your own clinical practice and think about ways that you can ensure that, you know, you are respecting, respecting and honoring the diversity of culture and experience among your clients who identify as indigenous. And so one of the first things that you know we wanted to talk about was looking at um, traditional versus commercial tobacco. And I'm going to hand it off to Lisa to lead us through that discussion. Alrighty, so traditional versus commercial tobacco. Uh, Megan indicated that she's been 10 years with uh, the nicotine dependence clinic. I've been with uh, Ontario Health, which is now Ontario Health, but with uh, CCO for almost 10 years in the tobacco program. And prior to that, I worked at probably one of the only indigenous uh, lodges that ran uh, smoking cessation, in-house smoking cessation. So for me, the knowledge that I gained uh, working with our elders is what I'm sharing with you. Uh, everybody talks about their PhD. I got my PhD from listening to elders and participating in, and there's a lot of different nations and a lot of different beliefs. So I'm just going to share with you some of the information that I have around traditional versus commercial, right? So traditional, uh, tobacco is not inhaled. So in ceremony, it's not inhaled. Uh, 
it's sacred, it's a medicine. And I would say majority of the people would know this in the communities, even if they don't practice this. So uh, traditional tobacco, it's uh, not always easy to get where commercial tobacco, you can just buy it at the store or in the communities at a smoke shack. Uh, traditional tobacco uh, is a medicine that promotes, I feel, uh, uh, humility and humbleness. Because when you put that tobacco in your hand, and I have some right here, this is uh, my very, very special tobacco. It's uh, red, red tobacco, as you can see. That and it's been struck by lightning twice, so it's infused with that energy from the spirit world. So, uh, this is special, it's not to be inhaled. And when I put it in my hand, I give thanks for whatever I want to give thanks for. I, uh, when people are in trouble or else if I'm seeking guidance. I put it in my left hand and I pray with it. And that's the true meaning of that tobacco, what it was meant for, that the creator gave us this tobacco to communicate with him. So I have it in my left hand. We put it in our left hand because that's the closest thing that goes to our heart, right? So that's why that tobacco rolls in the left hand, presented in the left hand and given in the left hand. Uh, it doesn't promote disease. You don't get addicted to it. Uh, it's uh, in different uh, locations within the province would use different uh, uh, different traditional medicines around them to make that tobacco. So in the south here, we have tobacco, this tobacco. Maybe in the north, they can't grow tobacco, so they might use kinikinik, which is a uh, a number of, uh, of medicines that are used. So there's all different types of tobacco. Uh, my brothers and the, my sisters in the United States, uh, in some of the southern parts, they have mountain tobacco that goes naturally on the mountain. So there's all different kinds of traditional tobacco. And uh, it was interesting. I'll share one little story. My friend. Uh, who was in Australia, she called me and she's like, Lisa, I'm having some problems. I don't know what to do. I'm like, well, you know what to do, but I'll remind you, put that tobacco down and go down to the water and put it. She did that. She called me back the next day and she was like, I'm totally a different person. So that tobacco really, really works. It truly does. In our culture, we believe it. It's a medicine and it's a helper. So it's a means of communication. So that's the difference between traditional tobacco and commercial tobacco. And Megan referred to, to that in the beginning about residential schools, about the 60 scoops, all of these, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? All of these things that have happened to have been instilled and imposed on our people uh, have impacted all of these addictions, right? So tobacco is an addiction as well. So, mm -hmm. so commercial tobacco uh, is uh, the opposite of traditional. It's not, uh, it's not a sacred, you inhale it, it's an addiction addiction as well, you smoke it. So I always share with people too around traditional tobacco and to show the difference between commercial tobacco and traditional tobacco. I said, you, when you're in ceremonies, you don't see our people all standing around with their pipe, right? So everyone's not like, oh, I got my pipe. Or, so that's the difference and to be mindful of that traditional tobacco and how it was given to us traditionally and how it's, uh, been misused over time and, and became an addictive process to get people addicted to that uh, commercial tobacco. So recognizing diversity. Is this me or you, Megan? 
That's you, Lisa. <laughs> okay. So to recognizing the diversity and even me as an indigenous person, as a first nation person, I have to learn this the hard way too myself. So recognizing the diversity, I'll share with you. I went to Ottawa to uh, introduce myself when I first got into this job and I was, uh, went to an Inuit organization and I was bringing some resources in to try and build up that relationship. And it was a great relationship and I learned lots. And I learned from talking to my Inuit uh, indigenous brothers and sisters that there's no traditional tobacco in their culture, that it's not a belief system that they use, that it was imposed when the settlers came to the north and was a means of trade and offerings to them. And that's how the Inuit got addicted. So this is what we're talking about in terms of recognizing the diversity of just within different indigenous uh, communities and organizations in terms of how to work with uh, community in, in, in recognizing the diversity of uh, culture and beliefs, right? Megan talks about language matters, absolutely. And I think uh, as a human being to another human being is just to have those conversations and to recognizing those conversations. I remember I took somebody in with me from another organization to do some work and they're like, wow, it's a lot different in terms of the work that you do than the work that we do in our organization. So it's uh, to recognize all kinds of ways to work with our indigenous brothers and sisters and learning about that and recognizing that diversity. I remember too, uh, when I was uh, working with uh, the with, uh, person that I, I uh, honor and respect Cynthia from up north when we were starting out and, and sharing uh, tobacco, uh, working with the community. I said, you know, you're gonna have people that are gonna cry, uh, potentially cry about uh, t t t tobacco. And then one day she texted me and she said, I had somebody in my group crying because the, the way that we work with community is that they share their whole meaning around why they use commercial tobacco and how it impacts them. All those things, which is different than say, potentially mainstream way of working with community. So it's to recognize them and meet them where they're at. So thanks, Lisa, and thank you so much for sharing and sharing those wonderful teachings. It's always so nice to to listen to you and, and learn from you. And the other thing I just wanted to re reiterate around language matters is, you know, I've experienced this firsthand where I've been working with like an Inuit community or a First Nations community that doesn't actually recognize traditional tobacco and was using the term commercial tobacco. And it really had like no meaning for them and that the that their preference was to use just the word tobacco. And so, like Lisa was saying, it's really important to have these conversations um, so that everybody's kind of on the same page and we know what we're talking when everybody knows what one another is talking about. So just something to keep in mind. Language does really matter. Um, so the next part, we're going to switch gears a little bit and um, hit our next learning objective. And so we're going to spend some time talking about what are evidence-based and what are wise-based practices to supporting people uh, with commercial tobacco cessation. We're first going to start with uh, evidence-based practice. So I'm, uh, many of you, I'm sure, who are on um, the webinar today are familiar with this term but we'll just give a brief definition. So evidence-based practice is a problem-solving approach to the delivery of healthcare that integrates the best evidence from studies and client care data with clinician expertise and client preferences and values. So it's very much rooted within Western science um, and by extension, medical expertise. So some examples for commercial tobacco cessation would be the Canada guidelines, which are our Canadian tobacco cessation guidelines, psychosocial interventions. So these are the behavioral uh, strategies, counseling strategies 
that can support people with quitting. So an example would be cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, and then we also uh, would look to pharmacological interventions. So these are things like nicotine replacement therapy or NRT as it's commonly referred to as, as well as the prescription medications such as bupropion and varenicline. And then in terms of what an individual level intervention would look like within this context of evidence-based practice, that would be, you know, something like the five A's or the three A's if a clinician is short on time, which I'm sure many of you are already implementing this in your practice with clients. So something that you're very familiar with. It's what is recommended by our tobacco cessation, commercial tobacco cessation guidelines. And so this would really be about asking, advising, assessing, assisting, and arranging for support uh, for your clients. And then in terms of some, what some evidence-based practice community level interventions would look like, this could be, you know, increasing the prices of cigarettes, plain packaging of cigarettes, uh, increasing taxes on the purchase of uh, commercial tobacco, and then various health promotion initiatives, some of which you're probably familiar with, so that one of the main World No Tobacco Day occurs annually, May 31st, and then National Non-Smoking Week, which takes place in mid-January. So this is what we're referring to when we're talking about evidence-based practice. And now Lise is going to walk us through what some wise-based practices might look like for commercial tobacco cessation. Okay, based on learning through experience passed down by the elders, knowledge keepers, and diversity. So I'll read one thing that uh, I find pretty, and I, I referred to it earlier, uh, that what uh, a non-Indigenous person that I worked with uh, that I brought into the community. So this is what she said. I would like to share with you a message from a friend colleague from another organization whom I trust in the communities. So for me, when I bring somebody into the communities to work with, and this is my own uh, memo, my own checklist that if I don't want that person coming to my house to have dinner with me in my house, and if I don't feel that comfortable, I, I won't really bring them into the communities. I have to live in the communities. I'm from the community. So that's that's just my mantra that I use for the people, right? So I'll, I'll share with this. A colleague from another organization whom I trust in the communities. And this person, I love her. Helping clients change their commercial tobacco use is never cut and dry. This is her quote. Often times people smoke to help cope with the trauma they have experienced because it is often used in conjunction with other substances and because of mental health issues, just to name a few. I will never forget a training I facilitated with Lisa at blank blank First Nation Island type for confidentiality. A, co a client shared a horrific story of a community member who had tried to kill her. A client stated how profoundly this trauma had affected her life and well-being. Lastly, the client explained that it took her everything to come out to see us that day. I was so grateful that I was co-facilitating this session with Lisa for a number of reasons. Firstly, we could debrief the occurrence and ensure that the client was receiving all the appropriate care needed. Clients spoke to both of us. Secondly, as a non-Indigenous person coming into the community, it was extremely helpful to have an Indigenous person, Lisa there, who they trusted and knew. Lastly, Lisa is very aware of how racism and colonialism has affected Indigenous people. Lisa is also aware how said factors affect the social determinants of health. Smoking never occurs in a vacuum, and having the uh, aftermath knowledge is essential to provide care that will facilitate change. So those are some wise based practices of, of just having those conversations, and I. It's been my experience that underlying trauma is the reason why people smoke, right? And it's learning and uh, having those uh, those practices to start making uh, of those change in, in those teachings of, of uh, sharing and cultivating those relationships in the practice that I use in the communities around smoking cessation. So, indigenous tools. So, 
This is uh, some of uh, things that we use in the community. Uh, seven grandfather teachings, teachings of the good mind, Inuit Kulamaka principles, traditional activities, land based, art break, art based, working with elders and knowledge keepers, traditional medicines. And I want to also remind people that uh, additionally, we use these because traditional biomedical approaches focus primarily on disease progression and treatment. Traditionally, Indigenous healing practices and other cultural complexities often have not been taken into account in the design of programs to change health behaviors and improve health outcomes in Indigenous communities. So those are some of the, the means that, that I use in the community to try and make change. So, so honoring what is sacred. So uh, this is about uh, having those conversations and utilizing the traditional people in the community. I don't go into a community. I may briefly talk about some traditional aspects of tobacco, but I'm not an expert in, uh, in the teaching. So I have to be respectful and mindful that, okay, if this is what community wants, then I'll, uh, I'll talk to the traditional person in that community to learn and bring them into the workshops to talk to talk about that commercial tobacco, to talk about that traditional tobacco. So utilizing the expertise within that community. So that's what we mean about honoring what is sacred so that everybody can also learn that this person in their own community is willing to help and support. So, and it's learning to also know what is sacred and sharing the difference between what is sacred and what is not. So, in mainstream, you got public health, you have all of these things. Well, we also have our own, uh, our own sacred medicines, which is tobacco, sweat lodges, all of these things that can be utilized in terms of uh, smoking cessation protection and prevention. So, yep. So importance of community. So I remember uh, I was when I was first started at Kentucky Ontario's Indigenous Cancer Care Unit and the tobacco program. I would go everywhere and I would see these no smoking signs, and I'm like, you know what? I think people are desensitized to these uh, to these signs. It's just another uh, means of uh, desensitization. So I'm like, I have to come up with something better that would be more relevant, I think, and meaningful in our community. So I came, I came around this, our air is sacred, and so is our territory. Please do not use commercial tobacco here. So I'm not saying don't smoke. I'm just saying do not use it here. That's a respectful thing. Please smoke nine meters away, which is the gold standards of uh, where you can smoke at an entrance or a door. So. Those are the things that you need to look at when you're designing or thinking about programs of one, not to harp, two, to try and use what has the community's best interest and heart in it and the messaging around it so that people will say, okay, no problem. And those are some of the, the strategies that I have used in the community because I think that's more meaningful and into my spirit of uh, that I know I believe my territory is sacred, my land that I live on is sacred. So to me, this is more impactful uh, uh, in terms of uh, trying to make change within a uh, area around second, third hand smoke and not to smoke, so. Mm -hmm. Megan, you're on mute. I'm like doing too many things at once. <laughs> Advancing slides and unmuting myself is too much. Uh, <laughs> so um, another way that healthcare providers and allied professionals can, you know, approach commercial tobacco cessation is through this lens of two-eyed seeing. Uh, so some of you who are on the webinar may have already heard about this concept, but if you haven't, this guiding principle was developed by Mi'kmaq elders, Albert and Moderna Marshall. Um, and it really embraces this idea of learning to see kind of with one eye 
the strengths of Indigenous knowledges and ways of knowing, and then from the other eye with the strengths of Western knowledge and ways of knowing, and then to use both of these eyes together for the benefit of all. So what does that look like in the context of commercial tobacco cessation? Well, we can take the strengths of evidence-based practice, so Western knowledge, and wise-based practice, indigenous, way, indigenous knowledge, you know, which Lisa have just shared with us, can be combined to support commercial tobacco reduction or cessation through a very strengths-based and holistic approach. So this would be, you know, potentially combining um, some of the strategies that you're using in your practice, like the five A's or three A's and medications, but also weaving into those traditional teachings and activities, um, the indigenous values, working with elders and knowledge keepers, um, and traditional medicines. I mean, if this is something that, you know, your client is interested in um, pursuing. So, some other kind of ways that we'd go about doing this is again, just to kind of reiterate, we've kind of said this throughout, is that the approach should always be very tailored, very client centered, you know, presenting kind of a menu of options of in terms of like what um, a treatment, what treatment or a clip plan could look like. Um, and then your client really eliciting what they want. Um, again, very important to recognize the diversity among and within First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities. You know, we've talked about the language considerations. Does this person even want to have traditional teachings as part of their um, quit plan? And then also offering separate programming, just because the Indigenous ways of knowing will be so diverse and also the language across various groups. So you know, conflating, you know, having programming that's the same for First Nations and Inuit is probably not going to resonate as much as if it's been developed by and for those specific communities. The intervention should be very flexible and responsive, strengths-based and holistic, you know, as Lisa mentioned, um, rooted within uh, a very, like, trauma-informed approach, and then also focusing on harm reduction so that, you know, clients feel like they can build their self-efficacy as they move through their quit journey. Some other things, so if, if, it's, if this is important to the client if they, or the community, if they want to have those cultural themes and teachings into the counseling, you know, consider integrating that. But of course, it should be very grounded in the community and supported by the community. Uh, if you're working with a community to develop a kind of programming that's going to, you know, um, be delivered in a group setting or community setting, it's very important to build capacity like on the ground there so that, you know, there's a person a go to or multiple people there who are the go to people who can facilitate um, the, the, the groups or counseling um, and that it also allows for that buy in with the community. So, if there are people there in the community who they know, they'll feel like this is a safe program. Um, and one that has been made specifically for them and has not just been like dropped in um, from the from external people. Uh, integrating pharmacotherapy, if that's something the client wants and also, um, you know, encourage specifically for people who potentially are, you know, uh, very, who are heavily dependent on commercial tobacco. Uh, the pharmacotherapy can really help in terms of withdrawal management and, um, and support cravings, and there also may be some other traditional ways to to help cope with those as well. And then also, you know, Lisa had mentioned paying attention to specific needs and the social determinants of health. So we actually have, you know, a specific slide on this. So, you know, while there's this urgent need, you may feel like to address commercial tobacco to improve your client's health and well-being. This can be very challenging. Um, to do so in isolation of other issues they may be experiencing. So they may not see commercial tobacco cessation as a priority given the multiple stressors they may be experiencing. So, you know, this could range from anything from, you know, lack of housing, maybe they're experiencing food insecurity, they have a history of trauma, unemployment, et cetera. And so we really need to approach commercial tobacco use within a determinants of health framework. And this will take into consideration the individual community and the system level conditions contributing to inequitable health and how these conditions really impact mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual health. And failure to address 
these factors within, um, you know, when providing cessation interventions may result in clients not feeling supported and could really impact their ability to be successful in quitting. Um, we've also highlighted cultural continuity as a really key um, given its relevance and importance for Indigenous peoples. And so just to describe what that is, it's the ability to preserve uh, the historical traditions of a culture and carry them forward um, with that culture into the future. And it's closely linked to the concept of cultural identity. And cultural identity has a major influence on self-efficacy, uh, self-worth, and is a key health and well-being indicator among Indigenous peoples. And, you know, countless studies have shown, and, and I'm sure community can speak to this as well, just from their own lived experience, that um, if there's greater sustained cultural continuity, you know, despite ongoing colonization among Indigenous peoples, it can really act as a protective factor against negative health and well-being outcomes. So culture and protecting culture is can be very important. And I'll just pass it off to Lisa now. So I share this in the community too, reclaiming health as an act of self-determination. And I don't know if we went through this slide or not, but I always talk about spirit. I talk about spirit and to talk about and to quote uh, a dictionary, spirit comes from the Latin word for breath and like breath, spirit is considered a fundamental part of being alive. I've seen this resource and I, I find I found it to be one of the most profound resources that I have used. And I'll quote this one PhD -er that uh, shared this resource. My spiritual teacher taught me that addictive substances, substances are all spirit energy. The main point is that the intent replacing the act of partaking in an addictive substance is what determines whether the use is a sacred act or an act of sorcery against ourselves and our loved ones. Yes, you heard that right. Using a substance is an act of sorcery. When done in the context of destroying yourself and your family. Every time you inhale or chew, you'll get some kind of calming effect, buzz, or whatever. When you take the substance in this manner, there is an intention in your mind. These intentions are serious and generate a contract with the spirit of tobacco. And everybody knows what a contract is, is when you have a mutual agreement with someone, right? Well, when you use a commercial tobacco product, it tells your spirit that it will give you something and it always does as you know. So this is the spirit of commercial tobacco filling, fulfilling its part of the bargain. Now it's your turn to pay because you cannot get something for nothing. Remember natural law. Spirit wants spirit. So when it comes time to pay your end of the contract, you will have to pay in spiritual currency. This usually translates into a life. And it's amazing that with all commercial tobacco related deaths, we don't stop and wonder about the spiritual price of abusing its spirit. In the Indian way, they always say that it comes back on your family for payback. So in our, a lot of our teachings, I know in, uh, and uh, the Ghibli and the Shabe teachings, we talk about duality. So that's part of the duality of that spirit, right? When you misuse a medicine. And we know even in mainstream society that that commercial tobacco kills. So this is a, a tool that I use when I'm in the community that resonates with community about that natural law, about uh, you don't get nothing for nothing and that about the duality of of that so sharing about reclaiming health as an act of self-determination and it's interesting that uh, when we talk about self-determination what that means in the community and then we talk about that commercial tobacco how, how it uh and and like uh, i'm going to try and say this as respectful as i can but there's certain things that I can say in the community that not everybody else is able to say, you know. We don't have to worry about the government going to kill us if we keep on using these uh, these things and the, not the way that it was given to us. It's not a, a, a good outcome for our people. So we have to learn about self-determination. 
about what that means to us and it's having those conversations with community about about health what does health mean all those things so next lisa celine has a comment would you be able to share in writing what you just read i will try yes okay <laughs> and i'll go to the next slide for you so when we talk about that spirit and that sovereignty, and we talk about what does sovereignty mean? What is your vision for sovereignty? What does your spirit say? What does your ego say? What does respect mean? Relationship. And that relationship could mean many, many different things. It's not just that relationship with that tobacco. It could be that relationship with that person or that place or that situation. We talk about the next seven generations that come. What's our responsibility for those next set, seven generations and that responsibility of myself that I have to live in that good way? What about safety? What does safety mean? So even if you're a person, and that might be more of a harm reduction strategy of, of safety, of how, okay, I won't, I'll, I'll try and reduce my smoking, but for a harm reduction method, I'll smoke outside so my kids aren't around to uh, be exposed to that second and third hand smoke. So it's having those conversations around that. So through those lenses. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so the final part of our presentation as we wrap up are uh, exploring some promising practices and programs. Um, so we're going to share some examples of of these practices and programs just to note you know this is not a comprehensive list there may be programs that we have missed and so you know once we've shared if there's anything that you feel that we have missed or there you know you're aware of programming um, maybe in your community or um, other communities that you think um, is it, that you would like others to know about please feel free to type in the chat box you can write the name and you know, share a link and we can make sure that those are compiled and sent out um, in your follow up email that you'll receive. Um, at, I believe tomorrow. So, um, yeah, feel free to do that and um, quickly just before we get into um, what those programs are, um, we wanted to explore. You know, some kind of key things that you want to when you're, you know, looking at programming or potentially developing programming, you want to ensure it's culturally safe. So, this is a way that you can kind of go about doing this. Um, so, it's very important that uh, practices and programs developed for commercial tobacco cessation include the following 5 guiding principles. Uh, these are all rooted within community based participatory research or CBPR. Um, but are specific to um, CBPR with Indigenous communities. And programs that are built on these foundational principles will really help to ensure a culturally re uh, relevant and safe approach. Um, so in the work that uh, we do, uh, we try to use these uh, principles in um, the following ways. So, you know, relationships represents and Lisa's already spoken to this, um, the importance of building, the, building those collaborative relationships based on trust. Um, and, you know, she already articulated, she would never go into a community and then tell them what needs to be done. It's really about developing that relationship, um, it, be, it being the first step to this collaborative process of co-creating programming. Uh, respect refers to the mutual respect for, uh, you know, evidence-based and wise-based um, practices, uh, you know, we encourage communities to incorporate traditional as well as evidence based approaches to care in their implementation of programming is if that's what they want. Um, and then when we're meeting with community, um, we sometimes will incorporate traditional protocols if that's something that they want as well. So, you know, you know, if an elder elder present for the entirety um, of our of our um, meetings, you know, doing some traditional openings, prayers, smudging, and whatever else is relevant to the community. A relevance relates to the importance of putting community needs and priorities at the forefront of everything we do. So, you know, community uh, programs are directed and developed by and for the community. 
and we can provide support where needed. Uh, reciprocity refers to this idea of consensus based decision making, whereby knowledge is exchanged bi directionally between our organizations and the communities. And then collectively, we determine the best approach to implementation and then share knowledge to enhance learning from both sides. Finally, responsibility. And so this ensures we build capacity within the community to support commercial tobacco dependence treatment. Um, and this would be through something like tailored capacity building, training, resource development, ongoing coaching, whatever the community needs. And now we're going to share programs. <laughs> so here are some examples of programs that uh, you can learn more about with all the links we provided below, but uh, we'll give you a little brief overview as well. So go ahead, Lisa. So at the, we are now not Cancer Care Ontario. We've been amalgamated into Ontario Health. Uh, we have a website with uh, some information and resources about the Indigenous Tobacco Program. But uh, to go back to uh, what Megan said about building capacity within our, our First Nation Inuit and Métis communities, I'll share an example of, uh, of a true champion that I have worked with, and I'll give you uh, how we met and moving forward, how it translated. So I do a lot of partnering with uh, CAMH and the Nicotine Dependence Clinic. Uh, we've been on what we'll say road trips all over the place, and I, I love it, sharing and collaborating. Uh, I've done a lot of work with public health, but this one particular person that I met was at a CAMH uh, at a CAMH training, her name is Cynthia. And Cynthia now has been become, become, has become, I would say, one of the most uh, respected champions that I know in a uh, community regarding uh, commercial tobacco smoking cessation, anything to do with tobacco as well. Uh, I like to, uh, put a shout out in terms of her program that I helped developed in the beginning and supported her of uh, the sacred smoke program. So she is a true champion of learning both uh, indigenous ways and mainstream ways. So when we talk about programming, we have to look at what the community wants, meet them where they are. So maybe a community doesn't want to use those traditional aspects. Maybe they want to use uh, Western mainstream ways, and that's what we'll we'll do and support. Uh, I always share in the community that it's not my job to make you quit smoking because it's not. My job is to share the information with you so that you have and gain knowledge that will resonate, plant the seeds, and what you do with that knowledge is up to you. You know, it's, uh, it's planting those seeds and uh, I'll share like as well in terms of programming. I remember prior to working with uh, in, in with Ontario Health or Cancer Care Ontario uh, with our other program, we got funding from Health Canada to do smoking cessation. And our ignorance was we put in that 50% of all of our clientele would quit smoking once they came into our program. Boy, was that ever a mistake. What I learned from that mistake is that even though we share that information and people don't quit, they might not be ready to quit now. They might not be ready to quit next week, but who knows about next year? And this is what I talk about programming of planting those seeds. Those seeds will take up and grow eventually. And that's the mindset that you have to use is to share that information and share that information to whatever uh, the community needs, right? And it's not just one way or this way. It's a whole, I like to say, a menu of things. This is what I can offer you. What would you like? You know, those are the kind of approaches that you can use in the community, right? If uh, the community or the, the, the community members want to use apps, we'll use those. So those are all kinds of resources that can support and build capacity within the community. So if you want to know more information about the Indigenous Tobacco Program, please, by all means, come check out our, uh, our website. It's open and there for everybody to see. So, yes. So it has information about uh, all of our First Nation and Métis work that we've done. And it will. I did in the past 
uh, reference the Sacred Smoke uh, program up in Sault Ste. Marie with Cynthia. So as a champion of success stories. Do you want me to talk about this, Megan? I can if you want, unless you want sure. to. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. So another program um, that we're highlighting um, is, you know, housed within uh, the work that we do at CAMH. So it's called the Stop with AHACS program, um, but we also work um, not only with AHACS, but also Indigenous health organizations. And really the goal is to implement a culturally relevant and safe model for AHACS and Indigenous health organizations to provide free commercial tobacco cessation treatment with community members wanting to quit or reduce their commercial tobacco use. So if you're an organization um, that identifies as, as an AHAC or an Indigenous health organization, feel free to reach out to myself and my colleague Ryan. Um, our email is there. And with the program, uh, community members are able to access free, tailored, personalized nicotine replacement therapy, and uh, we provide capacity building for training with healthcare providers in terms of how to deliver, how to um, offer the medications as well as counseling strategies. So if you're interested, please feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. So I'll just put an add on to that. Uh, okay. yeah. I'm always a person that says, how come they have it and we can't have it? So when I started in this in this career path, I seen public health have the stop programs, and I learned quite a bit about the stop programs, right? And I'm like, what the hell, man? Our people could use this too if they want. So uh, we had a discussion uh, with uh, KMH and the Independence Clinic, and yeah, we made it happen within the Aboriginal Health Access Centers, and now it's translated into some of our First Nation uh, communities and. Maybe many of you guys will know what the STOP program is, but there's a difference between the STOP with AHATS as opposed with in public health settings. So any of that data that is collected through the AHATS is sole ownership by the AHATS. So CAMH does not collect any of that data because we've got to be mindful as well that we all know that data equates to funding and capacity building, all of those things with that, that data. So that was one thing that I wanted to make sure that with the AHACs that any of the statistical information that uh, was collected belonged to the community. And this is what I mean about a good reciprocal relationship that it happened with Cambridge and they're like, for sure. So I'm proud uh, to work and support uh, that relationship between Cam Age, myself, and within the communities. So this is uh, some resources that the government of Nunavut has. Tobacco has no place here. I've been to Nunavut. I've done training with people in the north. It's fabulous. It's a lot different than uh, than down here in the south. And we used culturally ways of uh, providing that training with our Inuit brothers and sisters. So that's a resource that you can use that tobacco has no place here. This is another uh, great resource uh, with uh, First Nations Health Authority in BC. They have wonderful resources, videos. I can talk about this one. <laughs> um, so, uh, two programs, which I'll highlight over the first two, the next two slides are the it's time toolkit. So this 1st, 1 was developed specifically uh, for use with uh, 1st nations communities and was developed in collaboration with an engagement circle of 1st nations stakeholders, community members. Healthcare workers, etc. Um, and really the purpose of these materials are to support. Healthcare providers or community health workers or community members in offering commercial uh, tobacco interventions with First Nations. It's comprised of six circles, with each circle focusing on specific learning outcomes, and they can be offered in, uh, in a variety of practice and community settings and can also be tailored to individual or group settings. 
Um, the resource was the content was developed using a lens of two wide seeing. So it combines both evidence based practices. So, for, so, in this case, cognitive behavioral therapy with indigenous ways of knowing. You can access and download the resource for free on uh, the link is there and um, you can access both word versions as well as PDFs. We wanted to provide the word version so that people can add in and make changes and, um, you know, adapt the material to their community because, you know, as we've mentioned throughout, there's going to be differences between 1 community to another. Um, we did work with. Uh, communities across Canada, but, you know, it's, it wasn't completely representative of every 1st nation across Canada. So that's just something, um, you know, we want to ensure that the materials should like, they can be tailored to the community you're working with. Uh, we also developed um, an Inuit specific version, um, and this was a partnership between us at CAMH as well as um, uh, TI in Ottawa. And also uh, another engagement circle of Inuit stakeholders, community members, um, commu and health workers. And again, it follows kind of the same um, outline, the same resources, but are completely different in the sense that the language is different, um, the ways of knowing are different. Um, and it was very important to um, do these processes separately because there is such diversity between First Nations um, and Inuit. Again, link is there in the chat and I'm going to ask if maybe Sophie can. Sophie, if you're there, if you can <laughs> thank you <laughs> um, <Yep>. share <laughs> the link um, for our listeners. And then the last piece um, before we end is, you know, just reminding you about the quit line. So uh, for many of you who are on the call, you're probably aware that, um, you know, clients can seek support through um, through quit lines. There are quit lines available across Canada. Each province and territory has their own. We also wanted to highlight uh, the indigenous specific quit line. So that is talk tobacco available through smokers helpline. Um, confident it's confidential. It's uh, free and um, the services are offered in 14 indigenous languages. Um, so those are the programs we're highlighting today. If you feel like we've missed any, please, please type in the chat. Uh, we would like to check those out as well. And, um, yeah, I had a question here for consideration. Um, maybe you can type it in the chat if you want to, but, you know, what is 1 thing you learned today that will empower your work in commercial tobacco cessation and supporting healing? And I also want to make sure that we get to some of these questions, which I know we've missed. So. You know, you feel free to type your response here. And in the meantime, we will uh, address some questions. Uh, we have a hard stop at one. So we have three minutes, Lisa, to get to respond. So um, the first question is, how can the impact of residential schools and loss of culture be addressed when elders have lost traditional teachings around traditional use and teaching specifically? What would you say to that, Lisa? So can you repeat that again, Megan? How can the impact of residential schools and loss of culture be addressed when elders have lost traditional teachings around traditional use and teaching specifically? So residential school and the loss of culture and language and traditional uh, knowledge. So I will share with the group that I am a daughter of a residential school survivor. Um, my mom went to four different residential schools within her lifespan from the age of, I think she was four or five till she was 15, I think. And uh, so for 10 years she went and uh, everything is a journey, right? Uh, it's learning and not every community will recognize those traditional elements, uh, even if so, for example, 1 community that I'm thinking about that 1 specific community, I will not really share, or I might just mention that if somebody wants to talk about or seek traditional, let me know and we can have a private uh, conversation around that. But I know for specifically in that community, it's based on uh, Christianity, which is fine. I can respect that. So, uh, for the elders that have been to residential school or the communities that have uh, that uh, 
that way of loss of culture, language, and teachings, just have a conversation around that, you know? Because of uh, residential schools, we can talk about that. So that's just a conversation that you can have, but make sure if you're non-Indigenous, have somebody there from the community with you to have those conversations. But that's what I'm saying. It's about relationship. It's about uh, a learned journey, right? It's about being, uh, having those courageous conversations to help empower people to change. So the, the, the one aspect might be, you know, because of residential schools, maybe that's why you're smoking. It's having those conversations of not knowing and learning, which is okay, but we're all in this journey to learn and share together. And that's what we're here to do for. Not only in this webinar, but within the communities as well. Great, thank you, Lisa. Um, that's really important. Um, I think I responded to some of the questions directly in the chat, and I know we have to leave. Lisa has to get to another appointment. If anything does come up, feel free to email either myself or Lisa or both of us or teach or whoever you want to reach out to. Um, we'd be happy to respond to your questions. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity um, to to uh, for this opportunity for us to share today. Thank you, Lisa. You're the best. Thanks. I just want to say one one more thing. So for me, there is no greater job than going into the communities and working. Yeah, sometimes there's a lot of like heavy stuff, but there's also that balance of a lot of fun and a lot of learning. So for me, it is the best. So so don't true. Be scared. <laughs> We've so got lots true. of fun. <laughs> so. Thanks so much. Um, and well, everyone. Yeah. I'll hand it off to uh, to Sophie. Thanks, everybody. Perfect. Just echoing what everyone is saying in the chat. Thank you both so much. That was such an enlightening and informative webinar. I know I really, really enjoyed uh, listening. So just very quickly, I know people have to head off, but uh, again, this webinar has been recorded and I'll be distributing a link to the recording this afternoon with the slides as well as those resources mentioned. Uh, so please feel free to share this with your colleagues. Uh, and then just lastly, if you missed a portion of today's webinar, or if you're interested in viewing it again, or would like to view any of our previous webinars, an archive list can be found on our website. Oh yes, and uh, Megan just wrote in the chat, uh, her earrings are from Indy City, if anyone is interested in supporting an indigenous owned uh, jewelry business today. so. Thank you all so much for listening, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. All right. All the best. See ya.